Hey all you cool cats and kittens, it's Tiffany here. If you're at home watching this, which you all are, then you've got some time on your hands for a little educational trip. So grab a glass of water, immerse yourself, and let's dive right in. I'm here to talk about ecosystems and the flow of carbon throughout. A food web has many levels with organisms intaking and outtaking carbon in different ways. Through various sampling experimentation, we can quantify some of the carbon used to figure out where it's all going. In this instance, we'll be using EcoPark to look at all the organisms and components of two specific ecosystems. Our beloved Smith's Lake, where I'll put some of the hard work we all did to use. And another case study looking at oyster artificial reefs in China, which I found in my search of the dark deep web. Google Scholar. Now, before I dive into the jellyfish and hardy head and festive waters of Smith's Lake, I'll outline what EcoPath is so we're all on the same page. After a quick Google search, Urban Dictionary defined it as a person so obsessed with environmentalism and being green that they deem any sort of infraction against their misguided mindset as the ultimate sin. Which sounds about right, but there's a bit more to it. EcoPath is a static mass balanced snapshot of an ecosystem. Using a balancing spreadsheet of various math formulas, it combines six main parameters into a box model that balances out energy and mass from various trophic levels. These parameters are biomass, mortality, consumption, diet composition, fishery harvest, and ecotrophic efficiency. The EcoPath model allows us to identify key aspects of a whole ecosystem rather than individual species, and it allows us to inform research and government management policies. So now it's going to get a little messy. With so many factors, it becomes a bit of a complicated web. The best way to identify and explain it all is level by level. At Smith's Lake, we had 15 groups that we categorized by their roles in the system and the taxonomy. If we answer questions such as who's eating who and what quantity, their biomass and population numbers, we can input our findings into the ecosystem and see what it's actually looking like compared to what we expected. We did not measure every group this year, but combined with previous years to get a snapshot of what the ecosystem would look like. At the top of the system, we had seabirds, whose numbers we had to halve due to a 5% too large fish guesstimate that put too much pressure on small fish. Seabirds are hard to measure because we don't have mortality and immigrations unaccounted for. We also didn't find any large fish this year because they've most likely been fished out as the system's been closed for about 18 months now. We assumed a trophic cascade would occur because of this, but our results are a little bit different. Another group heavily affected by the prolonged closed system is the benthic crustacean, as crabs were not present. They had no new recruitment from the open ocean and the group's biomass was largely reliant on the prawn measurements. There are other groups within the system, such as herbivorous fish, cephalopods, zoobenthos, which were measured from previous years' data, whilst epifauna, sessile filter feeders, macroalgae, seagrass, and detritus were calculated and measured from other literature. Small fish had a measured 0.36 biomass, which was average from three different group stars. For a cascade to occur, we would need a surplus of small fish. But the cascade demand, which was about 0.59, is almost twice what we observed. It looks like the small fish have been stunted within the closed system. In the year 2020, jellyfish dominate the Smith's Lake system. The jellyfish had two species, Philoriza and Catastylus, which is problematic for our model when one of them is photosynthetic. Due to their massive biomass, the model expects a high demand of zooplankton to feed them all. Even if we halve the numbers, the system will still need 12 grams per meter squared of zooplankton, and there's only about 0.1 of that available. The cascade of demand means we need 20 times the amount of zoo measured zooplankton. Usually there's never enough zooplankton because a lot is found within the epibenthic layer. But we had issues with sampling, sediment in the nets, and no computer analysis to make, and makes it difficult to account for more of the zooplankton. Give me, give me, give me a man after me. We can compare the proportion of zoo 
you plant into other groups such as small fish, jellyfish, and phytoplankton over the last few years. Despite a large proportion of the 2020 system being jellyfish, previous years had even higher numbers because the system was open and didn't close until 2018. There is also a high demand of phytoplankton as 2020 had a huge biomass, four times more than 2019 and eight times that than previous years. Agropath is useful because it allows us to have a better understanding of what the underlying ecological processes and improve our ability to predict changes in the ecosystem functions. At Smith's Lake, we can use previous years and our current 2020 system to see how the ecosystem will change over time. This model has a practical application. For instance, the investigation into the effectiveness of artificial reefs. A case study looking at the before and after ecosystems of an artificial oyster reef deployed in Laizhou Bay in China. The study used ecopath modelling to look at the trophic interactions, energy flows, keystone species, ecosystem properties, and the fishing impacts. We can see an ecopath model spreadsheet comparing the ecosystem before in 2010 and after the artificial reef was deployed in 2016. There's an increase in the number of trophic levels with more variety of species. These include the fat greenling, veined raper whelk, sea cucumber, and of course the oysters. We can compare the web of trophic level interactions with each group and species having varying degrees of positive and negative impacts on the bias of another group or level, which is a given with competition, predation, and other biotic influences. The study highlights that the artificial reef system improved ecosystem maturity. It is proven to be similar to a natural reef system. It enhances the benefits from benthic animals and low-level catches do not cause the system to collapse. The implementation of this system was for a commercial harvest and through the artificial reef, we can see an increased yield, um, even with two species, Japonicus and R. venosa, under intense fishing pressure, low trophic level catches did not collapse the system. Combining ecopath and artificial reef deployment, we can focus and explore comprehensive, multi-dimensional and long-term ecosystem improvements in order to increase the health and maturity of ecosystems. Hope you all enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. Wash your dirty, dirty hands.